Hi, I'm Emily Gong, and welcome to Art Focus Spoken. Our mission is to feature the voices of artists and unite creative communities across the globe. We aim to do this amid COVID-19 in our ongoing series called Creating Through Crisis. On today's episode of Art Focus Spoken, we are honored to speak with London, UK-based artist Rain Story. As the founder of Rain Story Illustration, Rain's professional career has taken her all over the world, receiving awards, exhibiting, and selling to private collectors. When not in the studio, Rain can be found taking long country walks with her dog Audra and sipping wine in vineyards in France. Today, Rain is speaking with us from the comforts and safety of her home in Ontario, Canada. So a fun fact is that Raina and I both did our Bachelor of Fine Art at Queen's University. Then both of us moved to the UK and fortunately we're back at home with our families in Canada during this time. And it's been really amazing seeing Rain's incredible journey and I'm so excited to be speaking with her today. Rain, thanks so much for joining us. How are you doing? Thank you for having me. What a wonderful introduction. Um, I'm doing well. Um, I think it's a you know it's an interesting time for us all and I'm adjusting well um, with that being said I think like most of us right now um, I've been feeling great empathy for those who are at risk and a sense of pride for those who are helping as well as importantly I'm taking it very seriously and abiding by the government restrictions and therefore staying home and getting a lot of work done in my studio Great, great. And so for audience members who may not know you yet, could you tell us a bit about yourself and your art? It's of really course. Nice we see some examples behind you, so feel free to point to them. <laughs> I should be covering them up. <laughs> um, unfortunately, they're not finished, so I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint in that regard. Um, but yes, I am a visual artist. I uh, specialize in realism. And I like to explore abstract concepts within my work. Nice. And so um, I see that you're in your workspace now. Is that correct? Yes, I am in my temporary workspace because, as you mentioned, um, I'm returned to Canada for the time being. And so I've kind of adapted uh, part of my parents' living space and they're happy to kind of keep me to a corner. I'm a bit artistically cluttered. <laughs> And so how have you found the adjustment back home? It seems like, so you've just made a makeshift studio in the space? Yes, yeah. So fortunately, I have left some of the work when I moved over to London. Um, as you know, there's a lot of kind of bulk to being an artist. So I have a lot of loose canvas and pieces that I had previously started but not finished, like this one behind me. And so it's kind of a nice opportunity to slow down kind of reevaluate some of the pieces and have a little bit of experimental fun in this time. Mm -hmm. So um, in the segment of Share Your Workspace, the idea behind it is that your workspace is not only your physical space, but also your mind space. So where your visualizations, thoughts and ideas flourish. And so could you share with us or sh kind of show us your workspace and talk about it some more? Yeah, of course. Um, so this is the space I'm currently occupying. At the top here, I'll just shift the screen. Um, I'm working on a triptych commission piece. This is for a walk-in closet in London. The pieces within, uh, the subject matter within the pieces are the belongings of my client. And so once I get back to London, I'll be taking these ideally completed with me and they will go directly into the closet where they're designed to hang. Oh wow! So this is a so there's some of us who will be joining uh, via a podcast, so they won't be seeing the video, but uh, the only the audio segment. So could you just do a little bit of a visual description of them? Um, because it sounds a little bit meta. Like it seems like these are belongings in the closet, and there will be paintings hanging in that same closet behind these um, objects. Okay, so visually these pieces um, act as a triptych. They hold the belongings of my client's closet, as I mentioned, where, this, where these pieces will hang. And they showcase three designer bags, as well as a couple of designer items. They each have shoes in place and they sit atop kind of a pedestal that's either books, um, art, artist books, or 
design books, even the World of Wine Atlas, I've tucked in there, of course. Um, I do like to add a little bit of wine into each element of my work. And one is on a box. And so the way the triptych acts is the centerpiece is kind of, um, it's Hermes. And so Hermes as a designer is quite uh, highly regarded. So I've decided to showcase this front and center and you sort of look up to the bag. It's got this sort of statuesque demeanor to it. And then it's flanked by a Chanel and a Gucci bag. And these are, uh, have elements around them that sort of dictate the character of the bag. And these all really, it's quite interesting because they do act as individual self portraits of the, of the client. And so on the left is the Gucci bag with, um, thickly platformed Louboutins. And so the character of the Gucci bag in this one is, has these flowers, um, that I'm doing in kind of a painterly watercolor sort of dripping quality. They've got studs within the bag. And so the whole sort of subject of this piece is, is not in your face, but it's a little bit harder, um, like deeper sort of paint. And then the one on the right is Chanel. It's got thinner shoes um, that are referencing the Gucci to the left, but it's more delicately done. And that also, I think, kind of evokes the character of that piece. So the bag's more subdued. It doesn't have anything on it. Um, it's more of a classy feel to it. So it sort of incorporates kind of the element of um, every occasion that you'd probably wear these, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'd be curious of how they're going to be hung or displayed later, if it'll be the portrait of these objects with the object beside them, or how she's going to decide that that's going to be interesting. Oh, yes, yeah, so they're going to, um, they've got this lovely space uh, within her walk-in closet that we, we sort of designed them in situ and I've just, unfortunately, because I'm in Canada, I've had to bring them here to paint them. Otherwise, I, I do like to kind of go back and forth a little bit, make sure that they're working really well with the space. But I've taken enough photographs and they're sort of inset into this space beneath, um, well, they atop a love seat. And so I'm going to bring in some of the colors of that at the end. They'll transform a little bit further. But essentially, there's these three panels um, on the top of the ceiling in this area and they sort of all as you stand everything has a perspective right so they sort of lead in and then that will focus on these three pieces that will hang sort of as you see atop the um the seat nice thanks for sharing and how about the one behind you so as you're talking i feel like i see a curtain sweep beside your <laughs> behind your face um so yeah what about that piece and is that just yes. like, is that like a curtain coming out or is that like a visual illusion? It's, so it's not a, a trompe l'oeil. How do you say that? A trompe l'oeil? It is actually a curtain coming out. It's the canvas that I'm using. Um, I'll show you. Just got my dog sitting on my lap. <laughs> so we'll get out of the way. This piece here is one that I've stretched entirely and then I've left the curtain hanging. So I'm working back into it in a looser fashion, but I'm creating this um, element of ideally the wind coming through the window situated in the back and giving this feel of direction within the air, but also movement on the surface of the table. I'm doing a playful element with some shoes. Yes, it's really cool seeing it from here because of um, the positioning of the, like, the window and the curtain. It feels like we can sense the wind coming through. Yeah, I should probably be doing this while I'm talking. Does that sound like wind? Yeah, great. And then, so for your workspace now, are there like certain things of your routine that has changed while you're back here as opposed to when you were creating back in London? Yeah, completely. I I feel like my routine is completely off balance at the moment, and I'm sure I'm not alone entirely in feeling that way. A lot of us have had to adapt our uh, work situations, and um, for that reason, I am trying to still kind of establish that structure. I'm also living back home with my parents, and I don't get to see them as much, so it's a balance of trying to spend some time with them, but also commit to my work and make sure that I'm getting things done throughout the day. So my routine basically starts with coffee and walking the dog, and then it evolves from there quite organically. 
Wonderful. And I know that you do a lot of international travel, so for commissions and for other projects. And so for those、um, times when you have to work from、uh, other places, that's not your studio in London, are there certain things you do to cultivate a space where you can best work? Yeah, that's a really good question. And for me, I'm, I'm very visual. I love aesthetics.、Um, I love the feeling of. Home because it's an environment that you curate for yourself and to feel well. And so, since I spend a lot of time traveling abroad, I take items with me that make that feel more at home. And I'm really bad for prioritizing my passion over practicality. So, I will, if I'm, for instance, if I'm doing some pieces on writing at home, I have. A pop art, really bright red typewriter that I like to use just to format ideas because you can't backspace. So you just have to kind of get out what you're thinking there and then. And so I am very much the type of person who you could find on the train to Paris, you know, bringing along my incredibly heavy typewriter, using that instead of my laptop, which is completely unpractical, but because it creates that. Um, creative edge in me. I just I go for it. I'll carry that around the vineyards if I have to, just because I yeah I feel like it's a better creative output for me than necessarily my Mac. I don't do it all the time, <laughs> but I certainly I certainly find、um, the comfort of home in in what I bring along with me. That's super interesting. So, have you always done that method with a typewriter? Like, how did you start doing that? Because I remember when I、um, used to do like、uh, life drawing and stuff, there was a mentor who told me, "Don't bring an eraser with you. Just keep going." And so, have all those loose thoughts on the page, and don't try to remove those strokes as you're brainstorming in the field.、Um, so that kind of reminds me of that. That which is yeah, that's that's a really interesting comparison, and it's so true. And I. Was very reluctant at first. I actually came across this typewriter when I was on a road trip. I was going through Austria and I was staying、um, at a very creative hotel. And in the in the room they had this setup, and it was very similar to the typewriter I ended up getting, inspired by it. But it also had this really bright red matching seat, and I just thought, oh, I'm so drawn to this. So I started doing some. Thoughts on it. I'm always kind of brainstorming ideas or noting how light impacts something that I might want to bring out in a piece of my work. So visually, I'm always kind of archiving what I'm seeing, and so I started laying down my thoughts on that. And it was exactly like your mentor said previously. I hum and haw. I you know I backspace. I'm never quite sure. I don't want to lay a mark down unless I know it's perfect. And that's part of working in realism is that. Perfectionist quality that sometimes you really need to shake up in order to better yourself. So I was using this, and I, you know, I kept a little piece of the paper with me, and I thought, oh yeah, that actually works better when I'm just brainstorming these ideas. And so I hunted for one on eBay, and that's that's why I've got mine. And I have a, it comes in a carrier case, so it's not like I'm actually, you know, like carrying it like this. As <laughs>、yes, I was thinking, so are you walking through the vineyards like just? With it on your like hand, and then like typing as you walk through them. Yeah, it's a bit. It's a bit like odds in one hand, typewriter in the other, and then I let her like hunt. And wow, so well trained. <laughs> She's your sidekick for a reason, right? You really.、Can't. Yeah, I, I, I just scribed to her. She, you know, so that's why it's my work's turning into more abstraction at the moment. <laughs> And I feel like it's amazing. Audra just like randomly appears. I feel like it's just like moments, and then we just like see her in the screen, and I love it. And she's just like so like nonchalantly minding her. I'll just keep bringing her in different forms of the screen so that people keep interested when I'm talking, and you know I've bored the rest of your audience. I'll just sorry for those who are visual who aren't、uh, visually watching. Um, I've got a sausage dog, which is what they call in the UK, which we call in Canada a wiener dog, and is actually a Dachshund or a Dash.、Uh, I don't know. There's so many names to the dog. To be honest with you, I feel like I should know what I have, but、um, but I basically I have the cutest dog in the world. So you do. Can you show us? So like wh- where she actually is right now. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Apologies. She lies on my lap. So this is this is odds. Audra, you're so tiny. She's very small. She's full grown now, which I I adore. She's so much fun to have in studio, and she works with me every day. So I am usually facing the other direction. 
I, d I don't paint without looking at it, but she sits on my lap and sleeps most of the day, um, periodically kind of trying to climb up me and get a little bit of attention. So we have a little play on my breaks and yeah, she's with me most days on my lap. Would you say she's a, she's a pretty big part of your daily workflow? Uh, yeah, she's a she's probably a larger part of my daily distraction. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, she makes the days go by really quickly. She's she's a real treat to have. So she's a year now, and yeah, it's been a part of everything creatively I've done for the last year. She's been, you know, the critic of. Yeah, it seems like you've had her for longer. Like I feel like she's just been part of you for a long time. Yeah, yeah, I feel like I feel like I've had her forever. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I feel like I couldn't be without her now. It's just it's so when you're working day in day out with you know three pounds on your lap, that definitely is missing when she's not there. So yeah, yeah. I'm glad I got to bring her. Flight, um, like such a long flight when she was coming back to Canada this time. Uh, so this is her second visit to Canada, and fortunately, dogs under ten kilos can ride. Um, with you in the cabin so she's got a little um, little carrying case that is so nonchalant that people don't even realize that I've got her on the plane and she just has to tuck in by my feet and is very very easy going when it comes to travel because she, she did that when she was a puppy like the first time I think she was around eight eight or nine months and she behaved really well so I knew that taking her here would be a better experience for her than being cooped up in my London flat yeah whereas here I'm I, you can't see unfortunately but I'm on a farm with 100 acres so she can roam and explore without being bothered by any other dogs in the park that's amazing I'm glad that Audra's getting some of her self-care every day um, yes she is yes better than I am a lot more exercise <laughs> so like what self-care activities are you doing these days Yes, I think that's a really important part of our days when our structures have been sort of taken or changed. Um, for me, I my self-care starts right at the beginning of the day. I like to put my time into making the perfect cup of coffee right now. Those who know the Canadian stereotypes will be amused that I put maple syrup in my coffee in the morning. And... So I, yeah, I like, I like to kind of start my day off with a nice cup of coffee. I l sit in a room with a couple windows and just appreciate the day quite quietly. Odds is sitting always on me waiting for the end of the cup of coffee. She licks out the inside. So it's a toss up to who likes coffee more if you see her waiting for it. But she, um, yeah, and then I take her for a little walk. So that's kind of the beginning of my day before I started to my work. Uh, which I've already told you is a little bit unstructured at the moment. And then I try to resume that at some point throughout, but I don't always get around to it because that that routine, that structure, you know, your own space isn't, um, isn't quite the same. But essentially before the evening, I like to take some time to do my, you know, skincare routine. I brought with me my really comfortable pajamas as well as a lovely silk slip so if I'm feeling a little bit off I might just enjoy that and make a martini which I am currently calling um a oh my gosh now I've lost it I thought I had such a good idea here and then I'm completely gone I'm, oh, I'm calling a quarantini so I in some tree evenings tonight actually Wednesday nights I do quarantini night in my silk slip I do my little face routine and then I might watch a little bit of uh, creative telly and then, yeah, so. Um, well, it feels like that's... we should have like a call later on then and just like have like happy hour while we're talking. Yeah, yeah let's do quarantinis together. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to find, I mean, that's something I'm striving for right now is just to try to find a little bit more balance. Um, I see a lot of wonderful people on my feeds doing uh, home workout routines that I'm wanting to get kind of on board with, with doing some copying and yeah and just yeah I think I think I'm very out of balance at the moment and it's tough and I think it's we need to remember to be kind to ourselves during this time and not just to focus on oh we need to have structure structure we don't have structure or things like that Exactly. And that's why I think when when we have more time right now, we're spending it on social media. And that is a great thing to sometimes find that 
we're not alone. People also are feeling a little bit um, out of sorts. But also there are some people who, you know, you look at and you're like, wow, you are bossing quarantine. Like I am not living up to that. I haven't done an ounce of exercise. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, but she's got, look her, she's got such little legs. Like she doesn't need much of a walk. So it's, <laughs> you can carry her and that can be like you you know just oh but she's so light too it's not like an arm workout or anything no it's not I mean more so is pouring my quarantini than carrying her around like that's probably the greatest like the shaking extent of my mixing that's getting um my arm work <laughs> I think some of us will come out as great chefs and cocktail makers so yes absolutely I think so those are two things I've been really inspired by because my parents um my parents have a wonderful stocked pantry more than I do typically in London so it's kind of fun to dive into and make something for them nice nice and so um are there usual times that you like to um create so like are you more of like a morning person or an evening person yeah that always changes but it changes in large blocks so in university I I don't know if you remember but um I would often spend late nights there, as would you. I remember your large pieces that took a lot of time. And so, but since I've been working full-time as an artist in London, um, I have my studio about 10 minute walk from my place. And so I like to try to get there Monday to Friday, sort of on a regular structure of nine to five. That doesn't stick to it because as you know, you can kind of find that creative urge at any time, but also you can be discouraged from it. So I do go easy on myself in those structured periods where if I'm not feeling up to it, I might re-evaluate um, and then go back later on at night when the ideas have formed because I paint largely from my mind. So once that idea takes place and I can see it, then I can convey it and little changes probably between what I see and what I make. Wonderful. And so I remember that you have a home studio, but so you have a studio actually outside of the home too in London? Yeah, I have a studio. So I in London, I currently live in Primrose Hill and I have a studio space in within the area as well. So it's nice because it, it creates a little bit of a separation from always working at home. It's it's great to have some pieces at home and I, I do. Often the ones that I'm really struggling with visually, how to place the colors or where to put the subject matter um, compositionally, I will keep with me, but that's not always the best thing. I, I know those who um, are listening who have been working from home probably more re regularly than usual right now. You don't always want to be surrounded by your work. So it's a great thing in kind of keeping your minds uh, busy but also when there's always a problem kind of visually looking at you on the other side of the wall you do feel a little bit stressed out by it so I like to maybe have some of the more playful ones that I'm doing for myself what I surround myself with and then the ones I'm doing commission more for work I keep at my studio that sounds like a good balance and so for the ones for your studio is it like an individual studio space or is it like a shared so you can work with other artists yeah, so it's uh, it's both. It's shared with other artists, but we all have our own individual space and a communal um, kitchen and some outdoor area. So it's quite nice because it it's so valuable to be able to pull somebody else in and say, can you give this a little critique or what do you think of that? Um, and so that's really, really beneficial for me, especially when the ones I'm doing for commissions, you just want a little bit of a, another perspective because you're not doing it just for yourself. Yes, for sure. Thanks for sharing that. So on to our uh, trust the process segment. So most often it's the end result of the artwork that the public sees, but there's so much more that goes into the, the work than meets the eye. So could you share with us an element of your work process that's really important, but we may not necessarily see when uh, we're looking at your work? Yes, so beyond the element of taking the time to do it and look at it visually when when you work in realism and you spend so much time looking at something you can sort of 
glass over I call it Sudoku eyes those who play Sudoku will completely understand I feel with me in that you can look at a puzzle for so long that the solutions don't show themselves you can be looking and and never find the next answer until you take some time and you revisit it and then it's right there in front of your eyes um so i tend with my work working realism i can what i say i get my sudoku eyes and therefore i'm not realizing that these blatant obvious things um maybe the way a light is hitting a glass and i haven't created the shadow that suits that therefore it doesn't situate in place so it's nice to have that um have that time for the piece and i guess the other thing that people don't realize is that things don't come together beautifully sometimes they don't come together beautifully even as a final result but i'm now only now getting comfortable with showing people pieces as a work in progress because before that I would show work or someone would visit my studio and I would say I, would, I wouldn't allow them to have any space or thought for themselves because I would mention oh this isn't going to stay like that and that's not fully finished you know it's going to come together a lot better and I'm going to enrich this color I felt like I had to describe these when actually an art form part of its beauty is within its journey and sharing that with people and I'm I'm still slightly uncomfortable with it um, but trying to um, explore that a little bit more. We're letting pieces, you know, some some are better half done. I've come through a piece and then realized, wow, you know, a stage prior would have been better because you don't need to hit your audience with so much visual. There's really something really beautiful to some loose brushwork that the viewer can merge those colors together or they can create, they can understand. And that's, um, something I can show within this piece. Yesterday I painted, I painted the fork in this piece, if you can see, have I got it on there? Yes. And so I painted that and part of me, I always want to strive for more and more realism, but actually up close, it's fairly loose brushwork. It took me, have I got it on? Oh, nearly dropped the dog. Audra. So much for Audra's nap today, huh? Yeah, I know. <laughs> She's like, what's going on? Um, so essentially, that was that was my internal struggle with... She's currently pulling out my headphones. With whether I continue um, making that as the foreground, something incredibly <laughs> realistic, or whether I um, just leave it. And I think that, you know, I slept on it and I've left it and I came back looking at it this morning and I thought, you know what, it doesn't... Like, I don't need to hit the viewer with detail on this piece. People understand it's a fork and actually it therefore can look slightly different to everybody's eye. And I think that's more important is as capturing that. Mm -hmm. And you put that, you describe that dialogue really well between you and your work. And a lot of I appreciate that. Yeah, that dialogue, it's kind of like we're waiting for to see it or like to have that. And it's just like, it's kind of frustrating sometimes and I just remember sometimes like I would bring a mirror in or I would like try to like put it somewhere else and then walk in and surprise myself to see if I could see like something different and try to have like other conversations try to promote that in different ways um yeah it's it's funny when you talk about your work because I think you spend so much time thinking about it that all oh, it doesn't often always you well as I am doing currently I can't find the words for it because you're just used to running through that visually rather than verbally true yes you're right in that and so um also in terms of pro uh, process could you walk us through a bit of your journey and um and also like how you're able to um, pursue your passion full-time now which is really amazing my journey becoming full-time was very much about trusting myself feeling like I was in an area where I could um, enjoy that frustration and passion and creativity that um, that I spend this time with myself um, on a daily basis and fortunately I quite like myself so we get along well and I um, had enough once I had moved to London um, I spent a little bit of time in hospital 
And over that course of time, I had to spend uh, a great deal of the beginning months in London recovering, not creating. And therefore, when I was at a position where I had the commissions and I had the opportunity to do so, I thought, I have to explore this. And fortunately, I have. And I love every day, even the frustrating parts of it, because I've been really fortunate to still be here and still be creating. And having um, a difficulty in your health, I think, allows you to realize where your passions and where the important things in life lie. And for me, that was creating and getting these pieces that I had been archiving in my mind. And if, you know, if I were to have not lived through that experience, then I would, you know, I would feel like I wasn't complete in in creating these pieces that I really wanted to outlive me. So um, if that kind of conveys correctly, then, uh, you know, that's why I'm creating full time is because I was, um, I'm fortunate to be here and have the people who enjoy my work and enjoy myself as I'm uh, spending enough time in studio to create the pieces. Wow. So, um, I mean, a lot of uh, art students or recent graduates, one of the main key things is how do I make a living um, doing what I love and continue to my art practice? And that's definitely like a really difficult thing to achieve. And also, if there's you mentioned some health um, issues that held you back from creating, so it seems like there's a lot that went on your life in these few years. Um, could we just backtrack a bit and just understand? So you graduated from your Bachelor of Fine Arts at Queen's. And then why did you decide to move to London? So I originally was moving to London for my master's, which I was going to be completing at Sotheby's in art business. I wanted to get into the art market um, part of the art world rather than the artistic practice. And I'm realizing that everything happens for a reason because at this point in my life, this is what I want to be doing. I, I, I want to create. And I think if I was doing anything else, I would be, you know, having too much exterior passion that I wasn't getting out there. And so um, when I moved, I was two weeks in London and then I unfortunately felt quite sick and I had actually seen you before then and as you can attest like I was I was what I felt like my normal self and was very well and we had a lovely time going through the National Gallery and then I was poorly very shortly after that I, I woke up and I thought I had the bad flu and when I went to hospital I realized that it was it was much worse than that and it had come on quite quickly so I ended up having emergency open heart surgery to save my life and I was told on Friday that I wasn't going to make it to Monday. They would have to do a surgery uh, immediately in order to have a chance. And it would be prolonged, but, you know, get my things in order to make sure that I was um, that I was able to go into this. So that was obviously calling my parents was number one priority to see if they would, uh, to, well, to fill them in on that. And... Also, there were decisions that needed to be made, like what type of valve I wanted, because that would impact my life with whether I was going to have children or have another surgery in my 30s. And all of this had to be made in in the moment because there just wasn't enough time. And um, I joke now that I only lived the weekend anyway, so I was feeling all right. But in that moment, you know, you're not you you aren't well and you're not understanding the severity of the situation. So um, which wasn't my benefit. And then um, coming out of surgery, it just meant that I had two months to recover just because I had to be on certain medication so consistently in order to get over what I had, which was endocarditis, a very rare blood infection. And um, in the in the time that I was there, um, I was around a lovely community of people. I was bringing down the average in terms of the cardiac ward and having as best a time as I could actually with with the circumstances so I made some friends that I currently have out of hospital and from our time in there and I you know I got to finally have this perspective because I was also really fortunate in where I Airbnb'd I when I had moved over and was seeing you I was at a place just south of the river in um, Camberwell and when I 
called the ambulance because of my symptoms worsening, I ended up at the nearest hospital, which was King's College Hospital. And that hospital is one of the only ones in Europe, to what I'm aware of, that have an endocarditis team that's specialized. So it's really one of the only places that could act so quickly in order to save my life. So I felt really fortunate and, um, and yeah, so after I finally got out of my, of my time recovering in hospital, there's still a lot of time that you need to recover with open heart surgery. And another aspect of that is mentally. So a lot of patients who go through open heart surgery, because this is your electrical outlet, your wiring heals a little bit later. It heals at different times for every patient. And so you do end up, um, the majority of us, I suppose, end up with um, some depression and anxiety and dealing with that. And so that part was actually a lot harder to recover from than the physical wound of being, you know, open in the chest and um, and going through the process of getting back into your physical well-being. But essentially that that resulted in a year of not really wanting to create and not being inspired to get to the easel. And I, I struggled through a painting that I'm still working on. It's one that's probably going to be a work in progress for the rest of my life, but I, I enjoy it because when you visually connect with something, you, you, you have that memory. It's almost in a, in a way like when you listen to an album and you're painting a picture, and if you look at that picture years later, you kind of remember the album that you're listening to. Um, that was something I definitely did a lot through university. I remember every album that I was painting to these pieces. <laughs> and so this um, particular piece that is my work in progress, is just a, you know, a personal development artistic creation that I will remember what I was feeling when I was painting these elements. And it's a nice, it's kind of like a bit of a journal. It reminds you of how far you got when you were painting a particular part of it and you know you you couldn't walk very far distance without needing a rest and now I can kind of re um reevaluate what I'm working on and um if that makes sense I suppose it's a bit convoluted <laughs> I think I've gone down a completely different track to your question but essentially um yeah I have been I have had time where I have not felt like working at all and um, it's just keeping, you know, when, when we're passionate about something, I don't think that dies too easily and it might need a little bit of time to recover itself. But when, when it's, when you're passionate about something, I mean, it's, it's still in there. It just might take a little time to, to heal. What a resilient story is I can only imagine like what you went through in such a short time. I remember you had a quite stressful move to London um, to do your master's degree and you got an Airbnb and school was going to start and then you were in the hospital and so you stopped your the master's degree and you just took the time to recover and I remember hearing it that you told me um, the doctor told you that you would only have the weekend and so you thought fine I'll enjoy that weekend for what it is but could you share with like, could you share a little bit more about what what was like? What was your thought process like in those few days, and what was that like? Yeah, to be honest with you, it's it's something that I was I was very comfortable throughout, and I don't know if that was because I was incredibly poorly. I I've met um, I was doing an artist talk at the sixty seven club, a wine members club in. England in London and I was giving this talk to a group of um, individuals there and I spoke part of this was you know through my creative journey and my process obviously this is a large part of it and I was mentioning that and a gentleman said you know I'm really sorry to interrupt you but I I work in this field I work in developing the technology for patients with endocarditis and hearing your story I just want to quickly interject and tell you if if you weren't present in front of me, there would be no way I would believe that you could still exist just because um, I had endocarditis acute. And he gave me the stats, um, which I don't want to mislead people on, but essentially after so many hours, 
your percentage decreases of surviving that my chances were scientifically zero. So during that time, it was I was blissfully unaware of that, which I think very much helps when you're just optimistic about situations. And I was happy and I told my parents afterwards because they fortunately they flew over and were with me when I woke up from surgery and I said to them and I was I was incredibly worried about mentioning this and I was embarrassed but I said I was I was absolutely fine with the chances I had and if I didn't make it and I I felt bad telling them this but I said you know I I feel so fortunate for what I've had and been able to do throughout my life and it, I mean it, it was this moment of feeling like it was the end so you are you know you're nostalgic and you're you're regaling these moments of of happiness and joy throughout your life and I'm realizing wow I think I think I've got a lifetime of it so I was I was oddly I was content with whatever um, was going to take place and that is something that I don't want to lose that memory of because it's important to you know to to cherish even the hard times and and then you know relish in in the positive ones wow thank you for sharing all of that I wish I could reach through the screen and give you a hug oh (laughs) I appreciate it how does this experience change your perspective on life oh oh completely um I've always been a really detailed person, as you know, throughout my work, and which I'll share some pieces with you. And I think this process has completely changed my, it's altered my perspective because I was on a path that was through university being incredibly interested in detail to a fault. I was so focused on it and within my work, but also within my life, I was, I had a scholarship, I knew the course I wanted to take, I knew I wanted to do my master's at Sotheby's following this, and with this sort of scheduling, I didn't see the beauty of abstraction, not in the canvas or within life, because I was just so planned, and then I had this experience which I could no longer go to Sotheby's despite my attempt, and Um, which is why I'm realizing that sometimes slowing down is so good. I was not fit for it. I escaped in a certain extent hospital during my, I would have three hour break between my, um, my medicine. And I decided hearing from Sotheby's that I might not be able to continue in my master's. I was silly enough to get on the bus and head to Sotheby's to try to stake my claim in that I wanted to pursue. I was so dedicated that two days after I got out of the high dependency ward, I was logging on to my student account and starting my essay that I knew was due because I was in touch with a fellow student who was dropping by some books for me and that. So I felt like I could continue in this path because I was so dedicated towards it that I sat on the bus and in in London buses you've got your priority seating and I dressed incredibly smartly sat in the priority seating and I had a long blazer on that covered my hospital band and I looked around and I realized the way I appeared which was healthy and young I thought okay I, I don't deserve to sit here so I managed to get myself up during the next stop and I sat in one of the regular seats. And so I got to Sotheby's, to the door of Sotheby's, which is- After your surgery. This is two weeks after. Okay. And uh, yeah, yeah, so you can understand I was clearly not in the right mind, but I, this is, this is truly how dedicated I was um, towards the path I had set out for myself. And so I got to the door and which is this grand, large, dark door. And when you have a injury within your chest, so I was I was cut through my rib cage, I um, or my chest plate, pardon me. I that's your like that's the fulcrum of all of your energy. So I could not actually get the door open. 
I, I was not capable. I, at this point, if I was trying to turn on the, um, I realize no one knows what this is. <laughs> if I was trying to turn on the taps at the hospital, I couldn't even turn the taps because that movement hurt so badly here. But I thought that I would go and be able to open the store. So I waited out front, waited and waited until someone came out so I could get my way in. And um, naturally I was very fragile and they looked at me and they said, absolutely not. And I cried more than I did when I heard that I had to go through surgery. I was, I was a bit of a mess from, from this because it was really what, was, what, what I saw as my next, um, the next phase of my life. So essentially it was a great experience to have because it was forcing me to slow down, forcing me to appreciate the abstract life around me and just more so kind of go with the flow of things, which has inspired my work because up until that point, I, in my art history studies, I was very passionate about the old masters. And I therefore spent all of my time focusing on the old masters that I really enjoyed and employing their techniques into my work. But I really didn't give any thought to any of the modern works, contemporary artists that are doing incredible innovative things at the moment. And, um, and also impressionism is something that I, I got into right after surgery. So I started reading the books and I realized that because I had blocked that out and I hadn't been interested in these periods of art, I, I didn't understand them. And when I started learning more about them and I understood actually what they were conveying or why they were producing these pieces, I fell in love with them. And in that sense, my artistic creation, but also my lifestyle went from incredibly realism and detailed to a complete uh, abstract uh, expression. And I'm embracing that. So I, I know my work is still quite realism, but my brushwork and I think what this next sort of chapter in my oeuvre will be is a lot more free and fun and colorful. Thank you for sharing that. And so like what piece of advice would you give to your younger self? Oh, I would give myself a lot of advice <laughs> to prepare for that. But there's You're something beautiful. Young, like, yeah, I know. I still need I still need advice, but um but we all do. I think, <laughs> I think there's something to going through it just head on. Um however I would tell myself um that not worrying about what people think allows you to be more creative. Wow. Yeah, thank you for sharing all of that. And so um, I think that now, would you be able to share with us some of your work and like some of the pieces? And so you started Rain Story Illustration really early on, right? You founded your own company and you started taking commissions and you're still right now. So how much of your art practice now is on commissions? And like, what are your other um, streams of funding yourself as a professional practicing artist? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm glad you touched on that. Because my, my, my kind of breakdown is that I take on as much commissions um, as I'm able to, whilst I still express my own work. So when when you're doing only commissions, you're not pushing your artistic boundaries because you're able to create them, but you're also collaborating with the individual who wants to hang that piece. So I separate my work into commission and pr pieces that I would like to produce for exhibition. And then aside from that, um, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be a sort of creative consultant as well, which I take on as much as I want in order to still socialize with people <laughs> um, which is so nice even in this because I feel like it's been the longest period that I haven't been speaking or interacting as creatively as I usually do so I'm still from Canada I'm working creatively with a couple of businesses and I just advise on um, 
some of their artistic direction. So that is an element that I like to pull in because I can use that as a way to be um, involved interacting almost on a daily basis with people um, because an artistic practice is so independent and uh, so I, sorry if I haven't fully explained probably probably I separate it a third of my creative work is commission um, a third is probably my own pieces outside of the time that I dictate for my work and then I do um, a, 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 probably a third as creative consulting or wine consulting and yeah and I love it <laughs> and so like for a lot of artists it's really like the business element like we think that business and art are two separate things but actually we need a lot of business sense to be able to pursue art professionally and um kind of run it like a business right so could you talk a little bit more about um the com like how you got into doing commissions and how you've made a name for yourself within a certain niche uh, I know that you started off and you you had some like wine commissions too um so could you tell us about like your story of starting with commissions yes and and that's a really good point that you touch on about uh artists and the business element of it because one thing that I find doing creative consulting is that sometimes you can be dismissed quite quickly as just a you know someone who visually expresses themselves when that's not always the case. I feel like people who have their own artistic practice, it's what doesn't get seen is the less glamorous side of the accounting and marketing and analytics and all of that that gets wrapped into it. So, um, so I have a I have a great deal of respect for all creatives and artists who are who are working in that capacity and still producing wonderful innovative work. So when I began, as I mentioned, I, I did pencil illustration, a lot of pet portraits, and then it evolved into more of the work I was doing um, from university onwards involved wine, which is part of my practice currently. I also study wine and one of my next big endeavors, if it's still scheduled in May, is my level three WSET exam, which is the Wine Spirit Education Trust um, qualification internationally. So I'm currently kind of, if I'm not in studio, I'm hitting the books, trying to get all of my vineyards, regions and um, all of that down, which is really fun. But that is something that's also really important for artists is that you can you can merge these passions and you can start learning about various other fields because there's an element with realism that you can you can convey what you want but also you have to be somewhat true to the world around you and I, I remember that when I was in Australia and I was working fitting suits and a lot of the printmaking I was doing was on fabrics I was being very experimental and I realized that during this practice, you know, fitting suits by day, there was all of these different slight rules, whether it was your tie should be a similar width to your lapel. And so that kind of merged into my practice when I was doing these fashion illustrations, I was keeping in mind these little rules, but also, you know, kind of treading on the line of what's um, not being, well, essentially treading on the line of not being too restricted and still having my artistic license involved in my practice but um yeah I know I'm going on into a tangent here but the um what I was what I was essentially trying to say is that you, you know you have to you have to have a, a a wide breadth of knowledge um for creating something visually realistically whether it's even just how um light hits glass different than it hits wood and having some sort of archive of that so that you can reference it if you want to paint it. So that's that's essentially, maybe I'm projecting my practice into other people's, but that's a lot of what I do. And, um, and I like to learn whatever I'm creating. I like to learn as much as I can around the subject matter, just because I'm interested in it. If I'm going to be spending that much time at the easel, I want to learn about it. So I listen to podcasts of wine, which is why I started into my wine education is as I was painting this painting of wine where wine gets poured in from the top part of the canvas it dances along all of the flavors that are within the wine and I have this silk in the foreground and so I was exploring this relationship 
between silk and wine and how you describe them, whether it's silky, smooth, opulent. And I was creating a color palette that matched kind of the palette, your literal palette of the wine. And that was something that I was really enjoying learning the podcasts of different um, different red wines at the time. And, and I think that was what heavily influenced what I'm now currently creating as I'm also sometimes present on the vineyards um, tasting with the producers so yeah nice and I think they're all very complimentary so um, you're very much into wine you've worked in fashion for a little bit and you've also worked with a jeweler right like jewelry I have. Yes. yes so all of these are very complimentary and we can see that through your work which is really great um, and then like in terms of commission so is it just like kind of by word of mouth uh, that you're finding it now or do you find that you go and do some outreach of building your brand nowadays um, through social media or directly with brands to collaborate like how does that go about yeah it's a it's a nice realm i love being in the commission process because you get to hear other people's creative ideas and collaborate in many different realms i now stick more towards wine a little bit of portraiture but less so um more kind of still lives and they naturally tend to incorporate wine so uh, I like that you think that my work my uber is complementary of one another I feel like it's a bit sporadic but it's just because those are all of the interests that I'm exploring including um, jewelry design which I still do on a commission basis but not uh, full-time like I used to design for um, for Harriet Kelsall so yeah I think it's exploring those and tying them in and um, and enjoying the whole process of who you get to create for and where the pieces get to hang. So in my commission work, I do a little bit of marketing. I'm, I'm on social media and I interact with the community, not for the purpose of, um, of work, but just kind of to, well... I don't, one second, I don't necessarily know what I do in terms of promoting. I don't think I... Like, do you reach out to people or do people just find you? I, <laughs> I, so it's funny because I'm on social media, um, not outwardly looking because at the moment I'm, I'm taking on a lot less commissions in order to produce, have more time to produce my own work. And so I don't, I'm not actively looking. Fortunately, I'm being approached through social media or through a talk that I'm giving um, because I do talk on, give talks on wine as well. So someone might be interested. And when, you know, the reason that I'm really interested in wine is because I think of it as an, like an ephemeral art. And I think it's something that's appreciated like art. It's, nice to have a conversation around it be amongst people and get different people's views whether it's on the wine itself or on a broader topic that's just being spoken about spoken to so I love everything about the creating of wine and the drinking of wine and painting wine so I when I'm giving talks about that it tends that people have a uh, a special bottle that may be of interest or a moment where they celebrated and had this bottle. I've even painted a commission for a gentleman who proposed with a bottle of wine and for their 20th anniversary, he wanted a painting because he had kept this bottle as well. So we did this really nice painting for them um, to, you know, remark that moment. And um, yeah, so I think wine, wine is something I love to explore for for all of those reasons and for what it represents to people. Thank you. And so on to our last segment of exciting news. So this is an opportunity for the community to hear about new projects that you're working on or just released from and your vision, your vision behind it from the creator yourself. Um, so can you tell us about what you're currently, well, besides the ones that you've already shared with us, um, what other things that you've just completed or are working on? Yeah, I can tell you about my last completed piece, um, which is a large painting of a horse. And going back to my subject matter being 
sort of abstract concepts in a realistic fashion. I've painted it in realism with elements that show through to the canvas. The canvas is, uh, even sh reveals itself, although it's got a predominantly large white wash in gesso that the horse resides on. And then the bottom two hooves reflect onto the surface so that it's situated in this element of space. And I've tried to capture it in, in movement. I like to add you know, as much movement into a work of art as I can. And the sort of abstract element of that, for those listening who are thinking this doesn't sound like that at all, is I've actually captured the hooves in a very bright fuchsia. So a little bit of fun. I'm, I'm loving color right now and trying to splash it everywhere possible. And so the, these hooves on the horse are, are almost painted, like painted nails, and it gives a little different effect to what would typically be a, you know, a normal horse portrait. Mm -hmm. And that sounds really fun. So uh, I was going to say like what you're wearing and also Audra, it, like you guys all color code coordinate with painting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I actually am in orange and I've got orange up there. I, I It's funny though, because you, it's, color is something that's so much fun and I think it's right now it can everything can feel a little bit gray with what we're all going through and so um, I think color is what we very much need and I'm trying to bring that in and sort of dance around my pieces because it's it's something that brings a contemporary twist so I've recently done another painting of a bottle of Dom Perignon and it has it resides on this gorgeous illuminating bright lemon yellow background and that where on its own this painting this realistic painting of a bottle could be any period of time it's labeled 1995 so I guess a viewer would assume from then till present but you you don't have this kind of sense of sitting in the contemporary and so I'm hoping that that's what that bright background gives it is this idea and I, I would love to do I would love to continue on um, maybe a couple renditions of that at different ages, giving some dust onto the bottle and see where that goes. Great. And so talking about like adding splashes of color and more positivity during these times, um, what's like a cool project that you've seen? Oh, yes. Um, I've recently seen on Instagram because I love to follow artists and see what they're doing and I think it's a tough time for a lot of different fields right now. One cool project that I think it's Lee Carter is doing in the art space is he's doing a project that's um, the artist support pledge and essentially you can put your work of art on your platform and sell it for a set amount across currencies and then once you reach a thousand in revenue then you support a fellow artist yourself so it's a nice way to promote the arts right now and hopefully keep people and galleries and everybody creative yeah that sounds like a great pay it forward project mm -hmm. yeah I thought it was really lovely so I, I see a few artists on my social media that are participating in that and I, I love it I love that people are supporting the arts mm -hmm. And so to end on a positive note today, I think we've already had so much positivity, but it's always <laughs> nice. Um, like what's something today that you're grateful for? Today, I'm grateful that our struggles will bring us all our strengths. Really well said, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. And it's my pleasure. The range of stories. There's so much depth to it and, um, I think that a lot of it will resonate with our community as well. And also at the end of here, I also want to give a big shout out and thank you to Kohei um, who made this video possible as well as the podcast. So thanks so much, guys. Thank okay. you, everyone. Thank you for dealing with me. <laughs> yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in. We would love to hear your thoughts or questions please let us know in the comments and review section, and we'll try to cover it in the next sessions. If you enjoy this content, please share and subscribe for more episodes. For latest updates, follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Art Focus Exchanges.